and go through the robot gamer strategy for the FLL season. Um, again, my name is Ayush. My name is Laura. And I'm Franklin. All right, so first we're going to start by going over this year's game as a whole. Um, so as you guys know, this year's theme is called Super Powered, so teams will be exploring the future of energy. And this is just pulled from the first website, but basically this season, teams will be reimagining more affordable, reliable, modern, and sustainable energy innovations that will help our community grow. So like they talked about earlier with Project, um, Project and Robot Game will basically be revolved around energy. So your guys' job as coaches and mentors, you guys need to know the robot rules, how the game works, mission goals and point values, and which missions that you and your team decide that you guys want to accomplish. So first we're gonna go over the robot game. So something that is new this year is that there are two home areas. So there's a mat right here, but it's kinda hard to see with some of the stuff on it. But if you look on the screen, um, there are two launch areas, these blue and red lines that are the quarter circles. And that's basically where you're, you can set your robot to actually go and do the program that you set it out to do. And then you have the two home areas on the left and right side that you store your attachments, your robot can come back to after completing a mission, just that kind of stuff. So something it's new this year with the two home areas, and it's really designed so that more kids can participate partially. So you can have four, up to four people versus in the past it's just been two people doing a, a robot run, which is really awesome. So... Again, you can have different variations of disbursement of your team. You guys will probably want to do four just so that maximum amount of kids can get involved. But you can have a team of two with one on each side of the mat. And you can have teams of three with two on one side and one on the other. But team members cannot switch sides during the match. So if I was starting the match on the left launch area, I couldn't go over to the right launch area to do a certain mission. The other person or people on that launch area have to complete that mission. Yeah, so but also just to mention, you can also tag team. So yeah. you can still tag team, but there's just you can't go across the map. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh. Okay. Very exciting. <laughs> so if it leaves red launch area, mm -hmm. it can then enter blue launch. Yes. Area. Okay. So you can't. That's actually what was going to come to that because okay. you can't. No, you're totally fine. Made my job a lot easier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You'd can't like I can't take the robot from the red launch area and say, okay, Franklin, now you do it on that side. I can't hand mm. it over to him. The robot itself needs to autonomously drive to the other side. So, so if it, it start starts there, it has to go there via the mat. It can't be like like it can't come into red launch and then us pass it over. Yeah, no. Yeah, so oh, like okay. the robot has to drive. So whether that be completing a mission and going, or you have a certain program designated to just send it over in mm. case, well, however you could mm -hmm. do it, but. Because you can just make one program that sends it in a straight line in that area and then it. Yeah. And then did you have a question as well? Yeah, just about the people where they go. If you've got 10 kids total on your mm -hmm. team, it's not that two of them are doing everything. So that's what you mean by the tag team, right? They can still, like if two do one mission, yeah. so, they can come out. Yeah. So. So yeah, so obviously as you can see, there's, so, there's gonna be two people, so a total of four people on the mat. Um, and then like, it's kind of all depending on how you want to set it up. So like, you can tag team, so um, you can have people switch out in and out, like so people that are sitting on the side, they can come in for the other two person or the other person that's on one base side. But you also have three runs that you, that you can utilize, right? So what you can do is you can have four people doing one of the first run, right? And then the other four people doing the second run that you have. And then you can just, I don't know, mix it up uh, for the last run that you have. So, there's a combination of ways you can do it, but obviously some people do prefer tag teaming, and then some people just prefer having, you know, switching the kids, the four kids every time they have an audition. Right. Yeah. So coming to just, these are, it's a lot over here, but these are just like basic um, table rules during the competitions. Again, you can have a maximum of four technicians or the kids doing the programs, two on each side. Um, again, team members can swap. They can tap out during the match if they want to. They just can't tap over to the other side. So like, I can't go from the right launch area to the left launch area, but if I want to get out and Franklin wants to get in, we can swap, we can tap out. Um, most teams will swap the role of technician between matches so that everyone has a chance to touch the robot, but like Ayush was saying, for you already get like 12 people doing it if you have three different runs, so it's already a lot of people who get involved. Um, all other team members must stay behind the rope or the line. There's typically like a caution tape around the mat so that kids can't step over. Um, before you launch your robot, it must be fully behind the red or blue line of the launch area. So um, all of your attachments in your robot must be behind that quarter circle at the start. And then once you press go, then your robot can go and do its mission. And then to get the robot from one home area to the other, it must be driven. You can't pick it up and then take it over. 
So this is just a better visual of the mat with the um, missions on it. So again, you have your left launch area and your right launch area, and then you have the left and the right home area. And what's nice about the home areas is that typically what happens is that once your robot completes a mission, it has to return back to the launch area, the base. But now with the home areas, you can actually just go into the home area and then that's considering like completing the mission. So let's say I wanted to complete mission number seven. I would probably end up going from the right launch area up and then rather than having to come all the way back, I could just go to the right. And once I'm in the black area, then I can touch my robot and it's cool. I was going to ask about that area. Yeah. It seems smaller now because it's on both sides. Yeah, right? there's two. So and there's... keeping that in mind, if I drive my robot off into home, but it's still kind of on the mat, yeah, so you just have to be mindful of that. That's why smaller robots are uh, generally the way to go because they're more efficient, that kind of stuff in there. You have more space because the thing about the home areas is that you also have to store all of your attachments on that. You don't get like a separate side table or you don't get a separate bin to hold your attachments during the run. So once you come to the table, your robot has to get on the mat, all your attachments have to get on the mat, and then you can do whatever you want with the extra space. It feels like they're really trying to get people to Yeah, models. definitely, yeah. Yes. Are there any like um, in future or in past ones? There's been like blocks that we can push out. Is there any of that in the in this one? Make sure it starts like. Yeah. And are there double on both sides? So nothing starts in home this year. Oh nice. Except okay. this dinosaur. Okay. Which is for mission nine, <laughs> which we'll demonstrate later. So then dinosaur stays on. That the dinosaur side. starts here. Yeah. Dinosaurs. Yes. Yeah. So just okay. one. The goal is to get the dinosaur from the right to the left, but we'll Got talk it. about yeah. that later. Um, just to reiterate, because I yeah. feel like I'm losing my mind this <laughs> second year, but so they start in one of the launch areas. Mm -hmm. They can end in one of the home areas, and that completes the mission. Yeah, the mission. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you just can't launch from the home area. So okay. Yeah. Every time you run a mission, you have to launch from the launch from the area, but you can you can pick return. up. Your, oh, yeah, your yeah. Robot can return in the home area where you can like touch it without getting a penalty. Okay. All right, and then review of all the missions, and then we're going to go a little more in depth uh, into the missions. Well, I'm going to explain a little more in depth, um, and then if you guys have questions while we go, just feel free to ask. Yeah, so the main component of the game this year are the energy units, which you guys probably saw in the video, are used in practically every single mission in some way. So the most amount of energy units you have are like the basic ones, the white and green ones that are stationed again at almost every mission. Then at mission nine, um, you have the rechargeable battery, which we use in the dinosaur mission, which we will show you in our demo. And then you have the water unit, which is used in mission 12. Um, the hybrid unit, which is that white and black one that's used in the hybrid car mission. And then the three fuel units that are used in the oil platform mission. Andrew, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm trying to like articulate what questions I have. I'm a new person because I'm completely like overwhelmed. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, if we're all. Oh, no, you're totally. Or junior high and elementary all have all these missions? Or yes. Certain ones per no, it's the same game for everybody to complete. And But each team can choose different missions based on what they want to actually do. So, like, one team might complete a certain mission that another team didn't even okay. get the chance to. So, is it's really no personal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It'll be at least like a like Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will say something that we didn't do last year. I was new last year, and I had no clue about any of this. Um, having remind me of your name, oh, Seth. 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 Coming and talking to them and understanding like what the missions were and how to do some of the easier missions, okay. I think really helps. So like for me, I just like wrote down like there was a lot more pushing, mm -hmm. which like for some of my kids, like it was nice to kind of be like, let's try this one first. Like, what do you think we can do first? And once they understood, it was like oh, I could do three of these, and it made more sense when they had more conversations of which each mission was and what was the point. Because otherwise it was like, this one looks so cool, let's do the dinosaur, and then we realized <laughs> we can't even program that part yet. So yeah. Like, so having an idea of the missions, I think really, <laughs> yes. It, okay. Like, I'm going to throw that into like... Yeah, and we'll talk about it. Like that yeah, as we move into the strategy portion, we'll definitely talk about it more, but we really recommend showing the kids the video that you guys just watched because it's really, it's nice to get a visual to see. Yeah, you can see like pictures of how the missions work, but seeing an actual video of how you earn points is really much more helpful. And then Laura's going to show you with the video, now they have the slides, the slides will match the video, but then have more details on each slide. Yeah. It'll be really awesome. It's great that they put this together for you. And Stefan, can you say what you said about just thinking of it in three, and I know we'll go into what 
Well, I, I said that um, I think that each mission has three key components. One is to get the robot to the mission, and then then the second part is the mission itself, whether it's lifting something up or grabbing something or whatever that might be, and then getting back to home, right? You know, and so uh, I think that that's a good way to help the kids. In, in Job said this too. They you know you have to subdivide the task, and so just kind of roughly subdividing the three parts is a good place to start. And I, I also recommend they actually start with the second part, which is to say, if they have to build something or an attachment, they should practice that piece and set the robot right in front of the, the model or the mission and run that bit of the code. You know, can it do that task? And then we worry about getting there. Because if, if, we, if we build the attachment, and then only discover, geez, that attachment only works about half the time. We better come up with a different attachment. Well, then all that other work might be for naught. So. And Jock and Colleen, did you say there's an average of four to five missions completed during the robot game? I would say for a beginning team, if you can get three missions, three oh my gosh, yeah. celebration. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely yeah. celebration. Yeah. 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 And it was just, this team was two girls, that was the whole team. Yeah. And they came and they, they ran the mission and you know they had a little trouble and they ran it again and they ran it again and they completed the mission and then they ran that again and the new one and they ran that again and they ran that again and got that second one and then they stopped and I said, girls, you have like a minute left. And go, they said, that's all we got. <laughs> Team of two, and that was it. You know, that's all. Great. <laughs> the other thing you should know is that from the beginning of the day of the competition and the end, you will have, you should have more done. It's amazing to me how many the kids always come in with their three or four that they know they're going to get, and then they talk and they watch, and they, by the end of the day, they have four to six. You know, it just blows my mind that every year we see that growth on competition day alone. Yeah. So it's phenomenal. Yeah, so um, again, all this stuff was in the video, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth of it. So um, like the video said, the first way to earn points is if all of your equipment fits inside one of the launch areas. So the rule is that maximum you get both launch areas to hold all of your equipment, like your attachments and stuff, and your robot. But if you get it all fit inside one, then you automatically get 20 points without even having to open Spike Prime and actually code something. So. Is no, the dinosaur is part of the home area. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so this is just the launch area portion, so just like the red outlined part. And first is really trying to emphasize smaller designs and how they might be more useful it's for efficiency, um, saving time, that kind of thing. Can I just add on to that? Yeah. That would be great because so, this has happened to us several times where teams come and their arms extend past the quarter yeah. circle. And, and they, you know, they want us to be forgiving, <laughs> you know, and, and it just just make sure, don't let them get started thinking, oh, we'll just squeeze it in, you know. Yeah, yeah and oh. yeah, with the district teams, because they're not actually advancing and they're just kind of doing it for fun, we, the refs and judges and stuff do tend to be a little more, more lenient just because, like, we're all having fun at the end of the day. But for the junior high teams, if they're participating in the qualifier, um, those, those teams can actually advance, so we do tend to be a little bit more rule following with that. But, um, next slide please. So the next way to earn points is through the innovation project model. So like how we said in the project portion of FLL, you have a problem and you design a solution to that problem. Now with this mission, you can create something out of Legos that is representative of that solution. And then if you are able to, if your robot's able to transport that model so that it's at least partly touching the hydrogen plant target area, which is right in the middle of the mat, then you get 10 points for that. That has to be designed out of Legos? Um, yes. Okay. So that would be like your brother's team making a little propeller. Yeah. So those are pretty yeah. like creative and individual, yeah. Yes. Yep. And that has to fit in the launch area. Yeah, at least part at least for partly the, touching the oh for the for the point. Oh yeah. Yeah. Everything has to fit inside. Um so next is oil platform. So if a fuel unit, which are those black 
um, units that are kind of shaped like the energy units. If it's pumped into the fuel truck, you have five points for each. And then if there's a fuel unit in the truck and the truck is parked over the target, then you get 10 extra points for that. I have a yeah. question. So like logistically, like where are the fuel units? Next to the truck? Are they like, do you have do you them? Carry and you're them? Like, yeah. They're in like the big, you don't carry anything. Every, all the units are dispersed throughout the entire field. Okay. Yeah. So the fuel units start in this tower here. Oh, okay. And then when, every time you lift, lift that, up, one falls out. One pushes Got in. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. like, for example, one of our units are here, okay. and like, this is what you need to put here. So then that would just be sitting there. next to the yeah. toy factory. Like, just like, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. All units are on the map. Yeah. 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 yeah like, okay. there are three here. Knock them off, take them back, use them later. Oh. Because the fuel, the oh, units okay. can be, <laughs> the units can be used. So we yeah. want some of our units back in our house. So three That's units right. start yeah. here. You get points if you take them off. But if you bring them back and then say you put them into the energy storage here, okay. you get points for that. So there are some missions yeah. utilized. <laughs> yeah, because oh, okay. there are some missions that don't have them and you need to use energy units, but you don't have any unless you get them from a different mission. So just kind of like thinking about it if you're doing something like that. Yeah, they just push it out. Yeah. Yeah. They're saying this year you gotta earn them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So there are there are twelve energy units on the field that you can release and then grab, yeah. and then there are actually fifteen places that could use energy units. Okay. So no you have to pick and choose. No, no free energy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next mission is energy storage, which we're kind of alluding to a little bit. So if an energy unit is completely placed inside the storage bin, then you get 10 points for each of those, and you're allowed a maximum of three. So the picture's kind of blurry, but if you can see, there's four in there, but you still only get 30 points because you can have a maximum of three. And then if the energy unit is completely removed from the storage tray, then you get an extra five. So if the storage tray is pulled out and then the energy unit's taken off of that, then you get an extra five points. And then one special thing about energy storage is if you look right here, this white wall actually is able to come off Everybody's challenge set comes with this. It's bag 15. It's a lot of little one by one pieces. So it's like squares, flowers, hearts, circles. And each team can decorate this wall however they want. And then at competitions, you can take off the blank one and put on the designed one for each team. Yeah, it's super cute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's optional. If you don't do it, no. No. <laughs> it's just, it's just a, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> We're a competition. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So the there next. Core value oh. points there. Yeah. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. Put, put the team like initial on it. Sure. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Team, team spirit. Team, team so the next one is solar farm. So if an energy unit has been completely removed from the starting circles, then you get five points for each of those. And like Franklin was saying, if you wanted to collect those and then use them for a different mission, then that's also easy. And then if all three of them have been removed from the starting circles, so you get an extra five. So like in this photo, 15 for all three of them, and then five for getting all three of them in the first place. Question. There's a yes. lot of those. Well, Energy units, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like all of them. Is there enough for each one to be kind of placed in all of those starting circles, or do cert do you have to kind of pick and choose? Does that make sense, my question? Yeah, so there, there are 12 energy units somewhere on here. Mm -hmm. But if you were to fulfill every single put energy units here, max three, you would need 15. Okay. So, like, you could... Because th there are lots of them, like there's, yeah, there's a they're, they're all over. Okay. Yeah. So just pick and choose whichever's easiest, whichever's closest. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, so the next mission is Smart Grid. So if the orange connector, which is at hand on your field, is completely raised, then you get 20 points. And then you get an extra 10 points if the other team on the other side doing their run also does the same mission. So if they like both connectors are raised and they get a little like high five, then you get 30 points. And then, it was mentioned in the video, but first gave this mission as a guided mission. So basically, they've given you the code for this mission. So if coding's not really working at the time, at least they get some sort of points. But um, if you go onto the Season Resources page, and then you click on Guided Mission and Spike Prime Code, it'll open up the Spike Prime app for you. And it'll have the code already pre-made for you to use in your table run.
Yeah, and then when I go over like spike print programming, I'll show you guys where you guys can find this and like the research stuff. Yeah. So. Thank you. So this is really cool. This is a first time thing. They didn't have this yeah. before. They're handing you the code to run an entire mission. It's so it's all like you have to write is like the starting it's a freebie, position. But Pretty it's much. a freebie with, yeah. with, a, with a purpose behind it. And if you look, that code has sensors built into it. So we know that in First Lego League, kids don't use sensors as much as one would hope they would, right? And there's lots of reasons for that. But wow, how cool that they're handing kids code that includes sensors, the color sensor. So kind of give them that head start to say, hey, look, you could use it. Yeah. If you built a code like this, so I think it's kind of a wonderful way. You're also modeling the comment, which is that's also that's another thing we talked about. The little, the little boxes, so that's part of the software options. And so, lots of times, that's really great for kids to write themselves little notes for their partners to see why are they using this sensor or why did they choose this block, whatever it is, you know. Well, but it's a just a good skill. It's a very develop. important part of computer programming, right? It's that idea of using your comment codes. Just your and, and even at the high school level, when we do software at um, Husky Robotics, we really stress, like, emphasize using comments to make sure that people who are reading our code understand what's going on. It just overall just helps with organization and just helps yeah. with making everything so yeah, much easier. And you're not a yeah. team of one, right? Exactly. So what's in your head might not be in your partner's <laughs> head. Put it there in a comment code. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Just there are a way to share code without having to use Chromebook. Is there a way to share code from Chromebook to Chromebook, like, like in Google Drive? Um, or if it's on like my my spike prime app like can you get it on someone else's so i do believe there is a way to share i don't exactly know all the details yeah, but yeah. i know there is a way to share okay you, okay. Can, you can they can save the files download them and then move them where they would need to share them okay where did they go they move on to the email email can you email them? i think yeah you download or a file you email to be able to download the file and open it up on the spike prime yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It would have to create, create a drive for your drive folder. Create a drive folder. And have them drop them the drive. Drive. So that basically yeah. they do a save as and your drive and then or okay. into their drive. Yep. To be able to do it. Okay. It used to have Bluetooth on iPads. I wonder if Bluetooth transfer us go through the missions more in depth or go more in depth of the coding portion? Coding. Okay, so then, yes, sorry. Did you have a question? No, I want the second one. Oh, okay, <laughs> I was like, I thought you had a question. So, yeah, just because we're running out of time. So all the missions are on the slide deck, which you guys all have access to, just so you can go through it on your own at that point. Very well. And I love that you put student choice into it. Oh, we're going to shoot. All right. All right. Are we doing robot strategy or no? No? Yeah. We've got like 25 minutes. Okay. I think we're going to do robot strategy real quick. We're going to do robot strategy. But we should. Yeah. Okay. okay. Before we actually get into program, we're just going to do a quick overview of robot strategies. Something we really think is important to make sure you guys know before we actually go on. Yeah. So. So basic approach, you guys, um, it's kind of similar to the PLTW engineering design cycle that most of you guys probably know if you've been involved in PLTW. Um, basic approach is to basically just start with the foundation. It's really easy to use existing designs. And again, like how FIRST is really emphasizing to use simple and robust designs for efficiency and things like that. So this one on the left is the um, basic driving base that we built and we will demo in a little bit. And then this is the advanced driving base that requires the expansion kits that I believe we do not currently have, if that's what Mrs. Talaga said. But the driving base are, is really great. It's like a really simple, um, they give you the building instructions for everything. And then you do also want to consider sensors, motors, and how you might add attachments because you do need attachments to actually complete the missions in different ways. So more constraints. Again, all the equipment must fit in the two launch areas at maximum. You have a height limit to your robot of 12 inches. Um, extra storage space is not provided, so you can bring your robot and your attachments in a bin. Actually, you should bring it in a bin, because like I think Mr. Schmidt was talking about earlier, if a robot falls, the kid will start crying, and it will just not be good. So take all, your robot, your attachments, all in a bin, but then you have to place all of your stuff in the two home areas that are given. So just be mindful of that. And there's more information in the rule book. Um, so considerations before building, you guys do want to 
think of what missions can you group together based on relative location, same motion, whether it's like a push or a pull or things like that. Um, if it's on the way to another mission, and then if you want to pick up items for later, like those energy units. So a lot of times, teams find it easier to do multiple missions in one send-off out of the launch area rather than completing one mission, then coming back, and then going off to do another one. People, teams find it easier to do two or maybe three in one go, and then coming back. And then go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so when you're designing your attachments, you want to figure out what real-world example, like this bulldozer, is it similar to? So, and then also what you want to do is, how does it work? And there are three main types, passive, mechanical, and motorized. Passive is the most simple. Wedges, um, like a plow, going onto the mat and just pushing things. Um, that's very simple. You can do that to even get the energy units. Mechanical, which is springs, that doesn't happen very often because it's kind of hard to do. And then motorized, very common. Lever up and down, side to side, press a button, pull a lever. Something like that. So then when you're putting everything together, you want to keep in mind that at the competition, you only have two and a half minutes. So when your robot comes back to home, you want to be able to swap out the attachments and get it going as fast as possible. Standardizing attachments, which means everybody agrees, okay, all the different arms that our different groups are going to build are all going to fit onto one motor like this. And then you don't have, because if you're swapping out motors, that's a pain just swap out what's going on the motor and that's a lot easier. Also use your resources if you're stuck, find ideas, research, ask other teams, ask mentors, ask coaches. I like the word swapability. <laughs> <laughs> I made that one up, I love it. <laughs> so then you want to decide what missions you want to complete and just think what is attainable in two minutes and 30 seconds, which ones are the easiest and more points as opposed to harder ones with less points and which ones are manageable. Like there are some that you may, they may look easy now and then you'll build the mission and you'll be like, eek, that's tricky and then just don't do it. <laughs> um, and then also which ones are near each other or can use the same attachment, so same motion, both pulling, both swiping side to side, etc. And then for mission strategy, you wanna make a, a list of the missions the students want to accomplish and then figure out a priority and then at the end, you'll also want to figure out a list of which order you'll do them in. Like we'll do mission nine, and then it'll come back. And then we'll do mission eight and seven, and then it'll come back. And you also want to start off with easy missions and then progress as skills are developed. So this is like the concept of an early victory. For example, if you have two missions that are some sort of pulling, do the easier one first, celebrate that, and now that everybody knows how to build a mechanism that can pull something, go on to the harder one and then also group together in a launch. So close together, go out, do two missions, come back. Cool, okay, so now we're getting into programming. Um, so I'm just gonna go through the um, actual Spike Prime um, application that most of your students are gonna use. Oh, one second, okay, cool. Um, so, I'm just gonna open it up here. Okay, so yeah, so when you, this is kind of the homepage of the Spike Prime app, of the like programming app. So as you can see, as I was kind of mentioning before, on your left you have a bunch of resources right here that you can use. So there's like some build guides for just simple basic robots that you can use. Um, you can see all your projects that you have. Um, um, what I was talking about earlier about um, kind of like the, or the mission five, you know, where they give you the code for it. You can find that in this competition ready section. So that's going to be under units right here, unit plans. And if you download this competition ready, and I'm just going to open it real quick. So it will basically be just kind of like a lesson plan. So like so students can go through this, learn about how to like, you know, code the program to like drive around, um, just different other objectives. And then here you go, you can see the guided mission. This is last year's, I believe. I think this year's might be on here. I think this one's a little out of date, I'm not gonna lie. But um, again, you can also find it online, if anything. All right, so I'm just, we're just gonna create a new project. I'm just gonna run you through how to create a new project with students. So when students open it up, they'll go to the, they'll reach they'll probably start at the home page and then in the home page there's this little button called a uh, new project so we're going to click that and then for district like use and like for FLO we're going to use word blocks um icon blocks just are a little too simple and won't let us completely use all the features of the spike prime and then the python's a little too advanced but of course if students want to be a little more advanced you know they're like oh this word block stuff is so easy like i want something more, a little more advanced they can obviously use python um, this one thing I love about FLO is like there's a lot of room for growth. So like if students find like word blocks really easy, they can always use Python and kind of get a little more advanced there. But we're just going to stick to word blocks for now. 
And then when naming your project, um, naming your projects are really important. Um, they really help organize and tell like someone else what's actually going on in this project, right? So for example, we're later, I'm gonna be programming Mission 9, right? So I'm gonna name the project Mission 9. I'm gonna basically say who wrote it. So you obviously know kind of who wrote this project, who created this project, and then the date that it was created. Just to keep everything organized, know when things were made. Um, it just helps when you're looking through versions of like, if you try to go back to an older version, you'll see, okay, this is, this is the older version. So um, for our case, we're gonna do mission nine. So I'm just gonna do mission nine, my name, oh, and then today's date. Cool. So then I'm gonna create this. Let it load. So when you open up the project, and when students open up the project, this is the first block they're gonna see, uh, this when program starts block. This uh, when program starts blocks is kind of incorporated in this events like section. So the events section, so any blocks that you put under this when program starts is what's gonna run basically when you press play. So if you have like a drivetrain block or something like that, and you press play and it's under the when program starts, that's what's gonna run. Um, there's different ways you can trigger like the start of your program so you can do it based off like some kind of sensor right so if your color sensor sees a certain color you can have it run a certain uh, so certain blocks uh, there's also like you can do it like when some when a certain button is pressed on the um, on the on the spike you can have it trigger a certain, a certain code and then when it comes to movement, uh, most of your movement will be in motors and movement, these two sections right here. Um, the difference between the two is that motors is more specialized for only an individual motor. So that's when you only want to code like a single singular motor. Like so for example, on our robot, um, our little arm that we have is controlled by a single motor. So we'll be using motor blocks to control that. The movement on the other hand is for more like drivetrain kind of type of motor. So like two motors that you want to run the same thing for the same amount of time, um, that sort of thing. Um, so for us, we'll be using movement to obviously move the robot forward and backwards. So um, we're just gonna go ahead and we're gonna start with, um, okay, we're just gonna start programming mission uh, nine. So I'm gonna show you how to connect to the spike prime. So Franklin, can I get the, yeah, can you turn that on? Cool. So. When we go to connect to the spike prime, you see, there's this little on the top left. I don't know if you guys saw it. Oh, oh wow. Um, there'll be a little connect button on the top left right here. We're going to click that. And then, and then if you, you see this little Bluetooth button on the top, you're just going to hold that down until you hear like a little beep. Yeah. This might not work it's the first time. How to do all that connection and get it yeah, started by exactly. Yeah. 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 Can you give me the cable, actually? Yeah. Okay. So the first time you actually start this up, you might need to use the actual like physical cable to do this. Um, that's what we've realized. I don't know why, but your your spike prime kit will come with the cable like this, and you can just manually connect it um, through that the USB into the thing. I should show up now. Showing that sometimes to Colleen's tip is to use your Bluetooth on the Chromebook. Yeah. Yeah. I found it was easiest and to do that one. To like to connect on Bluetooth from the Chromebook and then go into the app and then connect through the app. Right, Jenna? Yeah. Is that what you do? Yeah. And we have those tips. We put those tips on our site too. But they do seem overall easier to connect on the EV3s for those of us who have worked with EV3s before. There we go. So three different, two and a half, two and a half, one. And are they all the same runs that they would be making, or can they? They can change them, but they're not cumulative. Is that what that's what you're asking? They keep the highest. Well, four goes two and a half minute runs. Yeah, they keep whichever one, whichever one was the highest. When I do with normal, I just put the same run. We just try to perfect it, like we're doing it the same each time. Right. We get four shots of the same test. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Just yeah. 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 No, that's good. So, yeah, actually, that was a great tip. So, uh, once I connected through actual the computer's Bluetooth and then I went to Spike Prime, I got it right away. So, um, 
Thank you for that tip. <laughs> I actually didn't realize that. All right, so a really cool thing about Spike that I really love about it is that you can actually see all the encoders and all like the sensors that are connected to your Spike um, through the actual application. So we can see like the color sensor there, that's there, we can see the two large motors, and then we can also see that singular motor that we have. Um, so this really helps when you're like, if you ever use a color sensor, right, you can just have the cars, you can see what the color sensor is reading at a certain point, and you can just see it on your app when you're programming. So um, right now we're gonna do mission nine. Um, we, Lar Lauren Franklin kind of explained that mission. So that's gonna be where we're gonna connect that energy model right there, the energy piece. And then we're gonna put in the dinosaur and then we're gonna have the dinosaur kind of move across the field. So the first thing we wanna do is that we're gonna have to, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the first thing we're gonna do is, um, the first thing that we have to do is when we kind of program the drive chain, we have to declare which motors we're gonna be using. So we do that using the set uh, motor, movement motors too. And then again, this is where also I really love Spike Prime because you can see exactly where those two motors are. So instead of like tracing the wires everywhere, you can, uh, the actual application shows you what two motors are connected at which ports. So our drive chain motors are gonna be A and B. And then the next thing we have to do is we have to set a speed. So we have to set how fast do we want this, how fast do we wanna go forward. And so I'm just gonna keep it 50%. Um, that is perfect. And then now here actually comes the block that actually tells how much to move it. Right? So when it comes to movement, there's actually four directions you can go. You can go forward, backwards, and you can go a clockwise and a counterclockwise, so like your right and your left, in a sense. And then there's um, units of to how much you want to go. So there's always centimeters, inches, rotation, degrees, seconds. It really doesn't matter what you use as long as you keep it universal. So if you want to pick one or if you want your students to pick a kind of uh, unit, just make sure that all students are going to use it throughout all their coding. It just makes everything easier to read. Um, and also when you run into issues like debugging, you don't have to worry about units as well as what, whatever is going wrong. Something so. that I thought was really important that someone told me, and I can't remember the phone, was to slow it down because the kids always want to go really fast, yeah. especially like it just looks cool. Mm -hmm. So I think reminding my kids to like, why don't we try to slow it down? Because a yeah. lot of times when they slowed it down, yeah. it all of a sudden would work and they're like, oh. Yeah. 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 And there's like no speed over 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the slower you go, obviously, the more accurate you'll kind of be because everything will be a little slower. You won't have that momentum kind of pushing like certain um, actions that you do. So we're going to do rotations. And then for this mission, we're just going to go forward three rotations. So at this point, we're basically right in front of that energy unit. So um, now we're going to have to move that small motor so that we can actually collect the energy unit. So to move the small motor, as I mentioned before, um, we're going to have to use this oh, wrong way. We're going to we're gonna have to use the motor section. So motor section um, is obviously going to be for singular motors, which the attachment is connected to. So similar to how we did with movement, we obviously have to set a speed and the actual motor that we're controlling. Yeah. How do you tell the difference between multiple motors and one motor? Um, so like you, through Oh, okay. Yeah, so through, obviously you can see like the little circle. If you see the little circle, uh, can I zoom in? <laughs> oh my God, I can't zoom in. Well, so, yeah, the pink ones have two wheels and then the, the blue ones have like one wheel. Yeah, <laughs> so that that would be a good indicator and just if you remember the colors, blue, one, pink for two. Um, so um, again, um, we're going to try to, so again, we can look at which motor our singular motor is, and that's going to be E this time. So we're going to click E to make sure that we're actually moving and setting the uh, values to the right motor. And then this is an arm, so we don't want to go too fast up and down where we might break something. So um, we're just going to go 25% for now. And then, so that's the speed, and now we actually have to do the movement, so how much we want to move this motor. So uh, again, we've got to set it to E to make sure that we're moving the right motor. Um, I believe it's a counterclockwise direction. So this might take a little testing on which direction you want to go. It all depends on like the way that your motor is oriented. So it gets a little confusing sometimes, but you can just, once you run it, you'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, this is going the wrong way totally. And just switch, the, switch to the other side. And then we're going to keep the units standard. So we're going to use rotations. And then we're only going to go 0.4 rotations because we don't need to go too much. Okay, so now, now that we have, 
we're at the energy, we kind of moved our arm down and we collected that energy, we have to go back. So now we have to move back into the base so that we can obviously pick up a robot and get ready for actually doing the dinosaur mission. So to move back, um, it's again just using the, how, again, how much do we want to go back, how much do we want to go back and we're going to use the pink one with the two motors because we're going to control the drive chain which uses two motors. Um, and then um, we're going to set a direction. So instead of going forward, we're going to go backwards. And then we're going to set the rotations. Uh, we just want to keep it standard. And then as many rotations as we went forward, that's how many rotations we're going to go backwards to get back to base. And this time I didn't declare like a speed or, uh, or like the motors. Because the only time I would have to do that again is if I want to change something. Because I already did it in the beginning of this program. Uh, I don't need to uh, every time initialize which motors that I'm using and which speed that I'm using. It's the only time I have to do it again is if I want to change it. So for example, if I want to go faster when I'm coming back, I would have to use the set movement speed block again, and then I would set it to a higher speed or higher percentage. So yeah, so this is, this is what's going to uh, help us accomplish. This is going to basically make us accomplish uh, collecting the fuel cell. So I'm going to run this. And to run it, I'm clicking this yellow button, this yellow play button. Um, during competitions, what I recommend is that you can use uh, a download feature right here and you can select which mission you want this to be. So which number correlated um, do you want this mission to be and you can select them through the actual display on the spike prime. So we're just going to keep it zero. All right, cool. And I'm going to run play. Give it a sec. Cool. So that's yeah. So that's collecting the energy, right? And so now we actually do the dinosaur. So um, if you want to move it up. Cool. Yeah. And now that Ayush has brought the motor and the unit back into home, now I can put the rechargeable battery into the dinosaur toy, which is going to give me the 20 points there. Oh, you can put it on your hand. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was yeah. So when something's at home, you can touch it, oh, yeah. and now I, I can put the thing in, and I can get the robot set up to position this way. Oh, yeah. Anything that's in the base is something you can touch with your hands. Yeah. Okay. And now... That's the key question that I feel like... <laughs> all of our all yeah. of our kids struggled with and yeah. I didn't know how to like advise them without like telling them the starting position and how important that is but also okay. like how to be more yeah. precise when like our kids are just they just want to program they just want to play so it's yeah. like how do you yeah I feel like how we do you run into it those? every year where they just like completely refuse to like build a jig or a measuring their device they just like and year after year, they just insist, no, I know, and then, like, it'll never work. <laughs> yeah, so I guess that's my question is, like, for you guys, like, how, like, do you build a jig? Like, is that kind yeah. of, like, we always we, recommend jigs yeah. just because they're the easiest and the most reliable because, like, even if, like how you said, if you think that, oh, I know this, it might be one square off and then your whole yeah. program's messed up, but on and the practice matches, you can He might not be there. Yeah. yeah, also. Yeah. He knows where it goes, but nobody knows. <laughs> yeah. 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 So asking questions. Um, you can turn it into a scientist. Better with the egg. Okay, you should say something on the to show because I know we have. Oh, yeah. So I'm just going to show the last part of this dinosaur mission or mission nine. Um, the last part is just going across the field um, into the other base to get your 20 points. So um, when it comes to coding this, um, I basically just kept the top half of what I had for the previous mission. And so everything stays the same, right? I'm still moving those same two motors, A and B, and I'm still going to go for it at 50%. Um, and then Instead of moving three rotations though, I'm gonna go 10 rotations this time because it's a further distance to get into that other base. But this is all I have to do for this mission because I just have to get it across and they can pick it up once it's across, right? So there's no chicken. <laughs> there's a mission there, but it's pretty out of the way. You have, a, you have a pretty good clear path to get it over. All right, so we're gonna run this. Franklin, do you want to be on that side in case we go a little too much? I mean, am I supposed to trust your coding? <laughs> What's a rotation? Yeah. So. Never mind. Just hold that thought. Ask them later. So I'm going to pause. First, we need to run a pause. Yeah.